nearly 50 years now since I became a Christian. I've uh, been a pastor for nearly 40 years, been in this church for two and a half years. And we're so glad to see uh, God work, working amongst us, bringing people in and building us up. So if you're here for the first time, well done on finding us, well done getting here, and we hope you're going to be blessed, and I hope that you will always remember your visit to this church, Benidorm, and you'll come back again and tell other people to come back and visit us. As you know, we're the only English-speaking evangelical church in Benidorm, and we're going to start the service this morning with some praise and worship to our God. The reason we sing to our God is because he's worth it, he's worthy of all our praises, he's worthy of all our singing, he's worthy of the adoration of our hearts. And there's just something very special, isn't there? When people come together from different backgrounds and sing the praises of God. Amen? Amen. That's a wonderful thing. Let's stand together and sing. Richard and Sharon are going to come and lead us in our first song. I heard the angels sing, glory, hallelujah. Let's sing. I heard the angels sing. Of our 
family and that would be an encouragement by being part of the family. After you go back to the United Kingdom, you can still continue on to be part of our Christian family here. Can you move that on, Ruth, for me? So on Wednesday, we have our Bible study in our prayer time, which is called, uh, we are looking at the parables. We're doing a deep dive into some of the parables that Jesus taught when he was on earth. He got 50 parables. And uh, we're doing a deep dive into some of those. And we had a great time last Wednesday looking at what Jesus taught when he taught about the wise man and the foolish man and how they build their houses. And one of them was wise, one of them was foolish because of the foundation on which they built. And now we'll be carrying on with a psalm, this, uh, a parable this weekend, this Wednesday. Let me get my words right. We're doing a parable this Wednesday. And we call them life lessons because they're lessons for life. And then we have our communion service on Friday at 11. Next Sunday, we're going to baptism Sunday. We have two brothers going to be baptized in the sea next Sunday. Uh, pray for good weather. Pray for it to be warm, please. Uh, and uh, we, I will be preaching on baptism, on why baptism is important as a Christian, what it means, what the Bible teaches about that. Um, and then we will have some uh, baptisms in the sea. And then after that, we're coming back here for some light refreshments. I was told not to call it a buffet lunch because that sounds very grand, but it is on the screen a buffet lunch. But it's going to be some light refreshments, some sandwiches and uh, sausage rolls and chicken nuggets and all that sort of stuff that you love, right? And we'll be having that. It's going to be good next Sunday, isn't it? Who's coming next Sunday? Come on, who's coming? Why would you not want to be here next Sunday? It's going to be good. Okay, and then coming soon, we have our Christianity Explored course. It's going to take place on a Wednesday afternoon at 4 o'clock to 5.15. This is for anybody at all. And it'll run for seven weeks from the middle of March to the end of April, around about the Easter period. And it's going to be great as we dive into Mark's Gospel and we find out who Jesus really is. Now, we get a little video on that, which I hope and pray we'll be able to put up on the screen for you to see and watch that right now. Make sure your Wednesday afternoons are kept free for that. That's going to be really, really special. We're building up to that here in the English church uh, as we build up towards Christianity support. We really believe God's got a good purpose for that in the coming weeks and months for us. And just fire up, fire up again, Ruth, that where we were on the... That's it. Thanks so much. So, we normally have a little time at this moment where we ask you where you're from. There's a lot of people here today, but it would be lovely if you could kind of fly your flag for your country. So, anyone here from uh, Germany? <laughs> We don't be able to clap everybody, so at least that's going to happen to Germans, right? Uh, anyone here from the Philippines? Yeah. Welcome, 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 welcome. Anyone here from Spain? Yeah. Yes. Anyone here from England? Yeah. Okay. Scotland? Yeah. Wales? Northern Ireland? Yes. Okay. South of Ireland? Yeah. Yes. Uh, India? Yeah. Yeah. Colombia? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm missing something, aren't I? <laughs> Iceland! Yes! Uh, Norway? Yes! Brazil? Holland? Yes! Belgium? No? Okay. Poland? Of course. I kind of think that's a world record today for the number of nationalities we have. Today. All honouring and praising Jesus together. That's great. Did I miss anybody? Have I missed China. 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 Yeah. Well done. Well done, China. Okay. Move on, on Ruth. For me. This is this is stopping me a little bit. We'll, we'll get it sorted. Okay. I'll oh, be there. Okay. Okay. It's going backwards. Okay. During the service, we're going to have an offering for the Lord's work here in Benidorm. And we'll do that during the next song, which we're just about to sing. And I want you to know as well that we can also, you can also give online uh, at <coughs> EnglishChurchBenidorm.com. Okay. God bless you. Let me pray for you. Then we're going to stand and we're going to sing a song. We're going to bring our gifts and offerings to the Lord during the song. And Marilyn will wait on us during the song. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence here today. We thank you for your blessing. We pray, Lord God, that you will all be honoured in our little gathering here this morning. Thank you that there is no greater name than Jesus. Thank you that there is no higher name than Jesus. Thank you that he is the King of Kings. 
and the Lord of Lords. And Lord, in our little corner here of Hori Principal, we lift up the name of Jesus on hand. We sing, come bless the Lord, all the servants of the Lord. We thank you, Lord God, that you are great, greatly to be praised. And we pray that you'll loosen our lips and release our tongues and freshen our hearts in order that we might praise and thank you. Lord God, we pray that you will move among us today by your Holy Spirit, that each individual who's here will sense the touch of God upon their lives, and that, Father God, you will touch them and bless them in a special way. Lord, as you know, we just pray over the services, we pray over the songs, we pray over the messages, but Lord, that's the process. The outcome is in your hands. And we pray, Lord, if there's anyone here today and they've not yet accepted Christ as their Savior, that this day, 11th of February, 2024, will be their day. When they pass from death to life, when they move from the broad road to the narrow road, and when they come to know Jesus as their Savior. Lord, it's a wonderful thing to be here. So bless us as we sing, <coughs> as we worship, and as we gather together. And may this Lord time be really sacred for us and this space be really special in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Let's stand together and sing a little song. My loving kindness. We're going to come to our Bible time now. And we're going to go to Galatians and 
uh, chapter 6 today. In Galatians, it is where we, we're studying today, and we've been looking at the book of Galatians over the last number of weeks, in fact, quite a few weeks, as we work through the Bible, passage by passage, section by section. And today we come to chapter 6 in this great letter. And actually, chapter 6 connects back to chapter 5. And so chapter 5 reminds us of something really important. And so before we get into chapter 6, I want to remind us a little bit of where we were with Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 26. And then into chapter 6 of this wonderful book of Galatians. This book was written by the Apostle Paul. Most Bibles say the Epistle of Paul to the Galatians. The Galatians were a, was a, Galatia was an area, it was a region, it wasn't a town or a city. It was a, an area, and uh, there were several churches in that area. Uh, but to the Christians in that area, Paul wanted to say something very specific. And we're very blessed that we have his letter uh, that he wrote to them. And, and that letter is full of truth, not just for what they were going through 2,000 years ago, but for what we're going through here in the 21st century. But it connects back to chapter 5, and I think it would be great if we just read again about the fruit of the Spirit. And if you were here two weeks ago, you'll remember we looked at the different fruits. Remember that? And how each of the fruits needs to blossom and grow in our lives if we're followers of Jesus. Let's read it together. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited and envy each other. It's wonderful. So the, one of the keys to this little passage here is what it says here. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So if you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit of God living in your life. The Spirit of God has to lead you. And the Spirit of God will never lead you into the works of the flesh. The Spirit of God will never lead you into immorality or into contentiousness or strife or divisiveness. That's a work of the flesh. The Spirit of God will always lead you in your character. And the character is more important than competency. Did you know that? Some people are very competent at things, but they have a lousy character, right? God is more interested in your character than in your competency. He's more interested in who you are than in what you can do. Remember that. That's so important. And so if you're a Christian, we're called here to keep in step with the Spirit. But let's go to chapter 6 now, and let's also read verses 1 to 10. And there is a reason why we read out the Bible here in church. It's because it's the Word of God, and we believe it's important. So if you've never read the Bible, or you haven't read the Bible today yet, this is your chance to read God's Word, all right? Let's read it out. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For each one shall bear his own load. Let him who is taught the word share in all good things with any teaching. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will also be. For he who sows his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows the spirit will of the spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household. Amen. So reads the living word of the living God. Now, when Paul wrote this letter to them, there were two things going on in Paul's mind. He had two concerns for them. You know the way sometimes as, as a parent or as a, 
and I don't you look at people and you just get a concern for them, particularly parents being very concerned sometimes for the choices that their children make. And Paul was writing almost like a parent to these Christians and he had two concerns. His first concern was a doctrinal concern. He was really concerned that these people in the province of Galatia were starting to believe some wrong things. And Paul knew that if, if wrong things lodged in their head and wrong ideas lodged in their minds, then they would soon start to go wrong in their lives. Did you know that what you believe always affects how you behave? What you believe about God, what you believe about yourself, and what you believe about other people will always drive your behavior. And so it all starts in the mind. And Paul was really concerned that they would get it right. The problem specifically in these uh, people was a problem of legalism. By legalism, I mean that some people were teaching them that in order to be proper Christians, they had to adopt all the practices of, of the Jewish faith. All the rituals and all the, 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 the daily washings, etc. And if they didn't do that, they weren't really Christian. Now Paul was kind of fighting a battle in their minds to remind them that salvation was by faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. Not by works. And so once you put your faith and trust and confidence and hope in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are saved for all eternity. And not anything else needs to be added into that to affect your salvation. That was his first concern. And so he addresses that in the early part of the book. And then he addresses the problem that they had uh, situationally. You see, they were there in, in Galatia and they were becoming a little bit complacent about their faith. So much so, in fact, that the, the little little church there started to divide. They started to like be angry with each other and be envious of each other and be conceited with each other. And so Paul was not only concerned about how they were thinking, he started to get concerned about how they were behaving. Now, why do you think they were behaving wrong? Because they were thinking wrong. That's why. And whenever you think wrong, you will always behave wrong. But if you think right, you will always behave right with the help of the Holy Spirit. That's why Paul said to them, keep in step with the, with the Spirit. Okay. In other words, always do what the Spirit wants. Always please the Spirit. Always live by the Spirit. And you will start to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And God will be pleased with that. And so in contrast to love and joy and peace and all those other things... Some things have started to go wrong in their lives. You see, that's why Martin Luther said in his inimitable way all those years ago, we must beat the gospel into people's heads incessantly because it's the one thing that we're prone to forget. <laughs> Can you imagine that? Martin Luther said, just find the gospel into people's heads because that's the one thing we're prone to forget. That's what Paul was doing. He was basically saying, how can you be so stupid? How could you have forgotten so quickly what you're supposed to know? So I'm going to tell you it again. I'm going to beat this thing into your head until you get it. Right. Now, in a way, in a way, you know, as parents, we, we still, you know, sometimes you teach your children lessons and they don't get it. All right. And you go like, which part of that did you not get? Let me explain again. Go and tidy your room. <laughs> right? Five words. Which bit of it? Do you not understand? Explain to me what you don't understand, and then I'll explain it to you again. <laughs> Maybe the key in that is the word tidy. Right? That's the key. And that's what I know. So sometimes, you know, people just get things wrong. And Martin Luther said, you've got to beat the gospel in people's heads. Because it's the one thing we're prone to forget. Do you know why it's the one thing we're prone to forget? Because it's the most important thing. And the enemy of our souls wants to constantly rob us of the good news of the gospel. You see, uh, if you're a Christian, you're not just saved by the gospel, but you have to live by the gospel. I meet so many people and they tell me, well, I got saved you know, 45 years ago, and I just want to say, can you live it a little bit? I'd like to see you living it now. All right? Yes, it's one thing to be saved by Christ and by the good news of the gospel, but we have to live this gospel every single day. 
And I want you to know this. I have to preach the gospel to myself every day. I have to remind myself every day of who God is, of how much he loves me, of what Jesus did for me on the cross. I don't just wait until communion to take bread and wine to remember what Jesus did for me. I have to live like that every day. Otherwise, like you, I'm going to go wrong. And I'm going to do stupid things. And I'm going to become a very unwise person if I don't live by the gospel. I think that's what Paul meant when he said, let us walk by the Spirit. So in verses 1 to 6 here, we have an, uh, a, a, a Paul addressing the whole idea of uh, community. Verses 1 to 6. Just get two points for you today so you'll be able to remember them. And the first one is this one. Verses 1 to 6 is all about the community that they're experiencing there in Galatia. This, uh, this section really starts with the last verse of chapter 5. And so here's the last verse of chapter 5 again for you. Because as you know, the Bible when it was written wasn't written in chapters and verses. Chapters and verses were added later to help us find our way through it. And I just believe that um, the, the, the chapter 5 verse 26 really belongs in the chapter 6. But this is what verse 26 says. Can we say it together? Let us not become conceited provoking and envying one another. So Paul starts to address a, a big issue in their lives. And you see, he recognized that in that church there were, there were uh, problems. And as somebody once said, the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. Right? That's the problem. The problem is not a, a, a mind problem. The problem is a heart problem. And by the way, sometimes when you're, you're sharing the gospel or the good news with a friend or with a, a colleague or, or with a, a neighbor or someone you meet on the street, and they start to argue with you or debate with you about creation or about where suffering comes from and all the rest of it, often the problem is not that they can't believe. The problem is that they won't believe. It's not a problem of the head because there is abundant evidence for God's existence and for the truth of the Bible. It's not that they can't believe in their head. It's that they won't believe in their heart. I spoke to a man this week and I said basically to him, if it was proven 100% without a shadow of a doubt that Christianity was true, would you believe? And his answer was no. No, because it's not that he can't believe. It's that he won't believe. The problem of the human but the heart of the human problem is the problem of the human heart. And it's still a problem for those of us who are Christians. We have this sinful nature within us that we battle against every single day. That's why we've got to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Remind ourselves who God is, that God loves us. Jesus died for us. He rose again from the dead. He's coming back again very soon. And to live in the light of that. And so Paul said to them, I don't want you to be, and he doesn't want us to be, conceited. That has not become conceited. You see, some of them there, there had a superiority complex. The idea that they were slightly better than everybody else. And Paul wanted to kick that one into touch right away and wanted to, to bang that one on the head. And said, how dare you have a superiority complex? Yes, you may have privileges and status in life. But that doesn't give you any right to boast about it. Those are gifts of God. And I don't want to say to anyone here today who feels, you know, I'm better than other people. I know more than other people. I'm more intelligent, more good looking than other people. Have a look in the mirror. Preach the gospel to yourself, right? Don't become conceited. Anything you have that's good is a gift of a gracious God to you. Anything. The other problem they had was some of them were envious. Let us not become conceited, says verse 26, or envious of one another. And the problem with envy was that they had an inferiority complex, some of them. Some of them were looking at other people in the church and going, oh, I wish I had his good looks. I wish I had his money. I wish I had his status. I wish I had his abilities. I wish I had his personality. And Paul says, you don't need to do that. You don't need to become envious of one another. Instead, he says, in the community, there needs to be caring of one another. You'll see in verse 2, 
we're told to carry each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. In other words, we are to look out for one another, listen to one another, hear what's going on in each other's lives, and somehow or other walk with each other, alongside each other, to carry one another's burdens. That's why, you know, God in his infinite wisdom gave us the local church. Right? The local church is an amazing place. It's a place of of learning, but it's a place of growing, it's a place of developing. You will get hurt in church. That's inevitable. But even the hurts are something that you can learn from and start to grow with. And above all, a church is a place where people walk with one another through the burdens and through the struggles and through the troubles of life. And I don't know how you get through life if you don't have people to walk with you when you're going through tough times. Let us not become envious or conceited, but rather bear one another's burdens, says Paul. He says this, if a man's overtaken any trespass, your spiritual restore one another in a spirit of gentleness. In other words, in church as well, we've got to be kind of gently restoring one another. That word there, restore, in the Greek language means kind of fix, put together. And there are many times I've gone to church and I've been broken and messed up by life and beaten down by the events of the week. And a, a word from a friend or a member of the church has kind of put me together again. Anyone ever had that experience? It helps, doesn't it? It's wonderful. But I want you to see, it says, bear one another's burdens. But then, obviously, in verse 5, it says, each man should bear his own burden. Okay? Is that a contradiction? How can we carry one another's burdens? And then it says, each man should bear his own burden. Okay, here's, this, here's the secret to understanding that. In verse 2, this verse, this word burden here is a different word from this word burden in verse 5. The first word refers to something um, uh, heavy, uh, something difficult, something massive, something huge, something that you cannot possibly carry on your own. It could be a financial crisis. It could be a bereavement. It could be a redundancy. It could be a depression. It could be something of such a huge nature that you cannot carry it on your own. When I was a child, we moved house once from, from one street to another street. We only moved a couple of hundred yards, actually. But when we moved a couple of hundred yards, we got a bigger house for our increasingly growing family. And in our back garden of house number one, there was a garden shed. And this garden shed was my dad's pride and joy. It wasn't a very big shed. It was quite a small shed, but it was, it was his, his pride and joy. And so therefore, he had to bring the garden shed with him from one house to the other house. Now, normal people would take the shed apart, <laughs> carry the bits, and then reassemble it. Not my dad. No, no. And if sometimes I do stupid things. This is why I do stupid things, because I'm a product of him, okay? He said, I think if I got enough neighbors, we would be able to lift the shed, carry it up the street, and dump it in the back garden. After all, it's only a couple of hundred yards. Now, was that a good idea? Yeah. <laughs> Who thinks that was a good idea? It turned out not to be a very good idea. Because as soon as they lifted this thing, there was this groan from all of our neighbors because they realized how heavy this thing really was. It was not an easy carry. And so they would maybe move about five steps and they'd have to put it down and have about a 10 minute breather and so on. And so whilst they started in the middle of the afternoon, as the sun started to set, they were still in this procession up the street. Now, by this time, there was a whole load of about 100 people watching the spectacle. <laughs> had we had mobile phones in those days, they would have been recorded on social media. And halfway through, my dad sort of, had, sort of reluctantly admitted, maybe this wasn't a great idea. <laughs> but by this time, the Lincoln Garden Shed is now sitting in the middle of the road with all the cars having to drive past. Anyway, to cut a long story short, and to get to the point, eventually, eventually, they got there, right? They carried each other's burdens. 
And never again was my dad ever to ask a favor from any one of those neighbors. His goodwill had been spent in one crazy decision on a sunny afternoon. Okay, that's what it means that we're to bear one another's burdens. There's no way one person could have lifted that. There's no way sometimes you can carry the big heavy burdens in life. But this verse, this verse is he puts it for his own word. That simply means and refers to something like this, like a rucksack, something that you can carry, okay? So that you may have things in your life that you can sort out yourself, that you can handle yourself. You don't need to ask, a, ask other people to carry that burden for you because you can carry that burden for you, for yourself. So if you need milk, God says, go to the shop and buy milk, right? You don't need your church family to rally around you to help you with that. That's something you can do for yourself. However, if you're really sick and you can't get out of bed and you need some shopping, we do that for you. That's carrying your burden. But if you're well enough, you carry your own burden. You look after your own finances. You look after your own health. You look after your own plans as best you can. But in the local church, there should be caring. Secondly, in the local church, there should be humility. Notice how Paul addresses this in verses 3 and 4. If anyone thinks himself to be something, when he's nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work, and then he will rejoice in himself alone, and not in another. He's really saying, addressing those who are conceited, those who think they're better than anybody else. Listen, the Bible says, God says, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says that you're nothing and I'm nothing except by God's grace. Anything I have is a gift of God, is given to me by God's grace. So Paul urges these Christians in Galatia, as he says to you, please keep humble. Please stay true to the man of Galilee who was the most humble person who ever walked this place and scene of time. And then Paul addresses this area of teaching. He says in the local church there should not just be caring, there should not just be humility, but there should be teaching. Look what he said in verse 6, anyone who receives instruction in the word must share all good things with his instructor. Alright, that's a verse that can be used in a different context to mean that, that basically Bible teachers and those who share God's word with you should be looked after. Okay, but effectively it means that each of us, when we learn something, should, should be happy enough to pass that on and to share that with one another. So when we're having coffee, we don't just talk about the weather or the football or food, but we actually talk about what we've learned in the morning service. What we've learned about it in a phrase or a sentence or a, or a word that, that impacted us. And Paul says, that's the community of God's people. Now when you wrap all of that together, really Paul is saying this. That a church, this is not a social club. This is a spiritual club. And I think that's really important. That if you want a social club, there are lots of social clubs you can go to. If you want a spiritual clinic, you come to church. If you want someone to diagnose your soul and point you in the right direction, you come to church. If you want someone to address eternal issues, not just temporal issues, you come to church. Church is never meant to be a social club. And if you go to a church and it's just a social club, find another church because it's not doing its job. It's got to be a spiritual clinic. You've got to come and hear the word of God. You've got to be exposed to scripture. Sometimes you've got to walk out of church hearing the preacher <laughs> because he has addressed stuff in your life that you don't like. Okay? Sometimes you've got to learn to listen and to accept and grow and mature and become what God wants us to be. And as Paul writes to these people in Galatia, two problems he had, a doctrinal concern, a situational concern. He's saying, listen, there's got to be caring, there's got to be humility, there's got to be teaching there. But remember that when you come together as believers in Galatia, it's not a social club, it's a spiritual clinic. And that's important. And this is a place where as God's word is open, and as God's word is taught, it is like a scalpel sometimes which just cuts you right to the heart. That's a clinic. And then once your sins are exposed and your 
failings are re revealed, then we remind you that there's a lovely Savior called Jesus who can heal every wound, who can meet every need, and can solve every spiritual ailment. In verses 7 to 10, very finally and very quickly, Paul says that not only is there community, but there's got to be ministry in the church. And um, obviously these two are kind of linked because in community there is ministry. So when you're bearing one another's burdens, that's ministry, right? And in ministry there is community. And community and ministry go hand in hand. And I hope our church here in Benador is known firstly for community and secondly for ministry. And not necessarily in that order. But that together we do ministry as we do community. You see the two things come together. And here's what Here's what Paul says. He talks about you reap what you sow. And he mentions reaping twice in these final few verses. And first of all, it's in this negative sense that you reap what you sow. And you definitely will reap what you sow, according to God. My best illustration of that is this man, Belshazzar. Belshazzar was the king of Babylon. As you probably know, uh, the Israelites had gone into exile in, in Babylon. The Babylonians had overrun the land in uh, 606 BC. They had taken, uh, they trashed the temple. They had taken the, 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 the special goblets and plates and the special holy items from the temple and they carried them all the way to Babylon and they put them in the treasure houses of their gods. And Belshazzar is the, the main man in Babylon. He's one of the main men in the whole world. And he throws a feast one night. And he's, got, he's, he's rejoicing in his successes and he's conceited and arrogant and he's a bully and he's just wanting everyone to know how, how wonderful he is. He's got this massive feast going on. As part of the, the spectacle, he suddenly thought, you know what? Why don't we get those goblets that we took from those Jewish people? Those goblets that we stole from the temple in Jerusalem. Why don't we bring them and fill them with wine and we will drink to our God. And then we'll see how good their God really is. And so Belshazzar gave the order and the servants ran to the storehouses. And they brought these goblets that had been set aside for the Lord and dedicated to the Lord in the temple of God. And they come from Jerusalem and were now lying in, in, in pantries and cupboards in Babylon. And Belshazzar said, give everybody a goblet, fill it with wine. We are going to drink to our God's from the goblets of the one God who says he is the one God, but he's not really because we know our gods are bigger than his God. He's mocking God. He's defying God. And as they, as they drank and as they engaged in revelry and enjoyed the party, suddenly a hand appeared. You can read this in Daniel chapter 5. And a finger started to write on the wall. Many, many, Tekel, you farsen, which means I have considered the matter and your days are numbered. And the Bible says that Belshazzar, this arrogant, loud mouth, bravado, king, ruler, started to shake and tremble as he would because God had turned up. The one true God had turned up. And that night, says the Bible, that very night, Belshazzar died. And Darius the knee took over. You cannot mock God. You cannot mock God. If you try to fight God, there's only ever going to be one winner. Did you know that? And it ain't going to be you. You cannot fight him. You cannot mock him. You cannot blaspheme against him. The Bible says this, it is a fearful thing. A fearful thing. To fall into the hands of the living God. And Paul says here to these Galatians, you will definitely reap what you sow. If you sow to the flesh, you're going to reap destruction. And by the way, there are different ways of mocking God. Sometimes we just mock God by ignoring him. He speaks time after time after time after time. And we just shut him out, shut him out, shut him out, shut him out. Don't want to hear, don't want to hear, don't want to hear. That's a mocking of God. He's speaking to you. He who hardens his heart, says Proverbs, 
multiple times, shall suddenly be destroyed. And that without remedy. Belshazzar proves the truth of Galatians chapter 6 that you read what you saw. It's a solemn passage in Daniel chapter 5. And if you're here today and you have in your heart been rebellious against the living God and against his love and care for you, my strong advice to you today would be do not go one more day in that state. Repent. Confess your sins. Believe the good news. And you will find that you've got a loving God who's willing to forgive and accept you into his family. Because the last little bit I wanted to share with you was it's also a positive promise. You will reap what you sow. Not just negatively, but positively. So if you sow good things and you live for the Lord and you seek to keep in step with the Spirit and by God's help of the Holy Spirit you seek to see the, see the fruit grow in your life and you try to avoid what he warns us against here, against conceit or against envy, you will see how God just comes and uses you to bless other people. That's the way to live a successful life. And into this world, 2,000 years ago, walked this man, whose name was Jesus Christ, son of the living God, who never spoke a wrong word. Not like you or me, we speak wrong words all the time. He did not. He never did a wrong thing. Even his enemies could not find anything to pin against him on his charred sheet. He was pure. He was holy. He was sinless. And they took him. And they led him along the Via Dolorosa. And they took him to a hill called Calvaria, Calvary, in the English language. And the Romans carried out the will of the Jewish and religious leaders. And they nailed Jesus Christ to that cross. And even as he died, he was praying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And he says, into thy hands, Lord, I, I commit my spirit. And then his final words on that cross was one word. It was the word, tetelestai. It means it is finished. He had paid the price for all the ugliness and rottenness and sin and disgusting immorality of our hearts. Our hearts are like a cesspit at times of wrong things. And Jesus, the perfect Son of God, took it upon himself. He bore our burden. He carried what we could not carry. He lifted what we could not lift. He took it upon himself. And our burden of our sin was laid upon him. Did you ever hear the old chorus that we used to sing years ago? At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. The things I carried, he carried them for me. That's the heart of the Christian gospel. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Please, Lord, if you'd be gracious enough Right, these truths and these realities in their lives. Help us not to forget them. And in our time, we will be somewhere else. We could easily forget what we've heard. But this has been special this morning. Your Holy Spirit is filled in this place. Do your work, Heavenly Father. By your Spirit, we pray. For the sake and for the glory of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Stand together with me as we conclude our service this morning. I'm going to sing a couple of songs together.
just play that over quite in the background. I just want to play right now. Okay. 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 Okay.
Christ, if you're a Christian, there's no condemnation, <coughs> right? Do not let the devil wear you down with guilt or shame. All right, there is no condemnation in Christ. When he brings your sins up against you, go say, go and talk to Jesus about that, because he's paid for them all. Amen? Amen. Go and talk to him about that. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be under the condemnation anymore. Jesus took my burden and he took it on the cross. He paid for all of my sin. All of them. He cried, tell us that. It is finished. That's why we can say no condemnation. Come on, let's sing.